Welcome to Inbox Roundup number 15. Today we're going to talk about uh, Ukrainian paratroopers, uh, separate brigades, Wagner and nuclear weapons, the short or short range air defense deficit in NATO, uh, Millennium Challenge 2002 restart, whether that was justified, and cluster bombs and minefields. Hey, before I get started, I'm going to be at the Texas Cyber Summit in Austin, Texas, September 28th through the 30th, where I'm going to give a lecture about how America will lose the next war. I'll be covering DevOps, ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance, AI, chips, and I'll be covering information warfare. You can sign up for the conference in the pinned comments below. This will not be recorded, so if you want to meet me, come to the Texas Cyber Summit. And as always, if you want to support the channel, buy a Think Outside the Bomb, Department of the Boat People, or a Live Laugh Launch t-shirt for Patriot or High Mars. I also have hoodies and stickers. Don't like t-shirts? Join my Substack for five bucks, where I can show you footage that I can't show on YouTube, or get a cameo greeting for the person in your life who loves the channel. Let's get started. So George asks, are paratroop drops and helicopter helleborne assaults feasible when there is no air superiority on either side? Are marine amphibious and riverine assaults feasible in the presence of 24-7 drone surveillance and corrected artillery fires? Or is it the nature of the current drone wars era making these types of special forces obsolete? So I think a couple of things to note here. The first is that uh, if there's no superiority on either side, then airborne drops and uh, helicopter insertions would be extremely useful. The problem is that neither side has air dominance. Now, both sides are relatively at parity, at least in, in Ukraine. Uh, both Russia and Ukraine kind of have air parity with a slight edge to Russia. So the odds of a mass tactical drop in a situation like that are essentially zero, uh, at least in a contested environment. If they can make that that uh, air environment uncontested, then it could be useful to have a para drop or some kind of air assault. Um, Russian paratroopers tried to do an air assault at Hostomel, and they got slaughtered. And it, it wasn't necessarily because Russian paratroopers or the VDV, it wasn't necessarily because they were bad. It was because they were given a hard mission. I mean, paratroopers are given the hardest missions, and they failed. And they failed because what they were doing was hard and it was poorly executed and things went wrong and uh, they never were able to link up with the unit that was coming from Belarus. So, you know, airborne operations are hard to begin with. That's why paratroopers are the elite because they have to be able to drop into an area and think for themselves and be able to walk in whatever direction and shoot everybody who wasn't dressed like them, right? So uh, I don't see airborne operations as obsolete, um, but they may not be appropriate for every kind of scenario. Now, with this says uh, marine, amphibious, and riverine assaults feasible in the presence of 24-7 drone surveillance, uh, or is the nature of the current drone errors making these types of specialized forces obsolete? So we're always fighting the last war. And I don't think that drones will be as critical in the next war due to electronic warfare. I think we're gonna we're gonna look at what's going on in Ukraine and we're gonna dump so much money into counter drone, specifically electronic warfare, EW. Mainly because EW is just it has a greater range. Electronic warfare has a greater range than the kinetic effects of, of any kind of weapon. Um, so I could easily see a situation where 10 years from now we're, we're launching all these drones and they're just getting they're just getting smacked. Um, so I, I don't believe there will be too much, uh, I, I don't believe that drones are going to make these kinds of assaults obsolete. Um, next, yeah asks, on uh, someone's FaceTiming me. Mr. President? Yes, Ryan, it's me, America's first president, George Washington, and a proud Virginian. And I have a bit of a problem. Well. Ben Franklin came over for a visit to Mount Vernon, and you know how he enjoys the occasional glimpse of, shall we say, exotic pictures on the electric knowledge system. Well, um, he can't seem to access anything. Oh, well, Mr. President, that's because Virginia actually banned accessing adult websites unless you can upload a form of ID, but there is a way around it. You can just use Atlas VPN. Click the link in the description below and you can get Atlas VPN for only $1.83 a month with three months extra before this summer deal expires. So 
Yeah, the state of Virginia did pass a law that requires you upload some kind of ID and get a third party's permission before accessing any kind of adult content. And uh, I can't even begin to describe how reckless it is to upload your PII or personally identifiable information to an unknown third party service provider. So the only safe way to get past this is to use something like Atlas VPN. That way it can make it look like you're in another location. For example, I'm in Virginia right now, but Atlas VPN allows me to change my location virtually to Las Vegas. This allows you to get out of the kind of restrictions that old people who don't understand how the internet works think are actually effective. It's me, George Washington, your first president. I once said that the alternate domination of one political party over another is a frightful despotism. So until this constitutional matter can work itself out, click the link in the description below and get Atlas VPN for only $1.83 a month with three months extra before this summer deal expires. Okay, where was I? Um, okay, yeah asks, what is a separate brigade? And uh, essentially a separate brigade is one that isn't permanently attached to a higher headquarters or a, a higher division. Uh, a good example would be uh, the 173rd Airborne Brigade Combat Team out of uh, Vincenza, Italy. Uh, these are basically units that have all the resources they need to deploy without getting attachments from a higher organization because they have everything they need to operate organically. So that is a separate brigade. Okay, next, Rob asks, didn't Russia move nukes to Belarus about two weeks ago? Considering Russia's history of lies and how fast the Wagner Group's mutiny rose and fell, I find it highly suspicious that a non-sanctioned mercenary group that's been the tip of the spear in Russia's offensive and is was woven so deeply into the power structure and neighboring country is in such close proximity to those nukes. Seems like feigning a fallout with the Wagner Group would allow Russia to escalate while washing their hands of the situation. And that, you know, my first master's was in engineering management where one of the things we studied was how complex systems fail. And one of the complex systems that we studied was the nuclear industry. So I actually do know a little bit about this stuff. Now, when it comes to nuclear weapons, just because Wagner is in Belarus doesn't mean they'll have access to nuclear weapons. And just because they have access doesn't mean they know how to assemble these nuclear weapons because they're not lying around in a, in a ready condition. Um, and even if they did capture one, they would have to, uh, you know, they'd have to assemble that whole component together. Then they'd need a delivery system. Uh, I don't know how many people in Wagner were former nuclear technicians that can assemble a bomb. So that's an issue as well. Then they need to mate the bomb to the delivery system. Then they need to actually deliver the weapon. Oh, wait, there's also the, the PAL, the permission act, Permissive Action Link, uh, which is a code that only like three people in Russia actually have that they need to activate this weapon. So th there's, there are a lot of steps to be taken for Wagner to capture and use a nuclear weapon. They're not just, they're not just sitting around the armory like, like a rifle. Um, now, I know some of the next thing people will go is, what about a dirty bomb? Dirty bombs are stupid. They, they aren't weapons of mass destruction. They're weapons of mass terror. Um, the, they, all they do is they, they explode and they throw radionucleotides as far as the blast radius can take them. Honestly, if you just walk out of the area, you'll be fine. Just leave the area. If you can leave the area, just leave the area. A dirty bomb is not going to explode like a nuclear weapon. Um, so I, I don't see this as some kind of feint for Wagner to use a nuclear weapon. Uh, nuclear weapons aren't that useful. Uh, they're useful for a breakthrough, but Russia just doesn't have the troops to mount a breakthrough. Um, they'd be useful to stop a breakthrough, but so far conventional landmines have been doing a pretty darn good job of preventing a Ukrainian breakthrough. So. There's really no good use case for a nuclear weapon. So that this nuclear talk has got to, has, it's got to end. I've had it up to, all the way up to there with this nuclear talk. Next, Tom asks, Norway is using the high mobility launcher HML, NASAM-based system that can be installed on track vehicles or Humvees that uses either the AMRAM or AIM-9X missile, the Sidewinder. Either of these missiles have a much longer range than the Stinger, and the NASAM system is a proven anti-aircraft platform. <clears throat> the uh, Chaparral anti-aircraft system the U.S. abandoned in the 1990s would be a close analog. Do you think the U.S. has a SHORAD deficit? Uh, so SHORAD, by the way, means short-range air defenses. I don't think the U.S. has a SHORAD deficit. 
<clears throat> this kind of follows along with the questions about whether drones will make special forces or air assault or marine landings obsolete. Um, the U.S. and NATO always have air superiority when they fight. Um, and I, I, in a way, I, I think it's possible that drones may become an evolutionary dead end. And I say that because many nations are going to look at this war and they're going to start developing counter drone technologies. I, I said this in the first question. They're going to develop these, these counter drone technologies and most likely these things will be EW, electronic warfare, because the range for electronic warfare is, is greater than the kinetic, kinetic effects of any kind of weapon. Um, <clears throat> when you look at Ukraine, drones are great. Drones are great. They're providing surveillance. They're, they're dropping some munitions. But what is Russia's most successful weapon? It's not their hypersonic missiles. It's not their, you know, it's not their T-14 Armada. It's a freaking landmine. Landmines are Russia's most successful weapon. And it's a weapon that's so low tech that it was invented during the American Civil War. Um, so I don't, I don't think we're in a shred deficit because I think the army understands that the likelihood of coming under direct air attack, meaning a, an aircraft attacking a unit is very unlikely. And I also think the Army is preparing for counter drone warfare using electronic warfare. Uh, so using SHORAD or, or do, the money that you put into something like SHORAD could probably better be used for precision fires or even uh, anti-landmine warfare or breaching wire mined obstacles, which certainly seems to be a lot more important in Ukraine. Next, AJ asks, I just watched a YouTube short star about the Millennium Challenge uh, 2002 and how General Van Riper defeated the US in a war game. That, this then prompted the military to restart the war game and applied more constraints to Van Riper, making it effectively impossible for him to win. I've seen this story a few times online, so my question is, uh, is, this, did, is this actually what happened and was restarting the war game justified? <clears throat> okay, so Millennium Challenge uh, 2002 was an exercise conducted in 2002, and it was made famous in the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. General Paul Van Riper was a Marine Corps general. Uh, he was the op for, the opposing force. So essentially the simulated enemy. And he just ran circles around the blue four, or the, or the good guys. So what happened was that the game referees restarted the war game with certain conditions, essentially uh, hobbling Van Riper so that the blue four was guaranteed to win. So the question is, is, was restarting the war game justified? And I think it was. First of all, you already have your objective. You have the paper about how the war game had to be restarted and how successful the op four was. So that's the win right there. It was in a book. It was, I mean, it was in blink. There's all sorts of articles about it. People know that this war game was reset to allow Blue Four to win. So why was Blue Four allowed to win? Because the exercise cost half a billion dollars, or a quarter of a billion dollars. So if, if Van Riper uh, sunk all of Blue Force ships, I mean, th that's great, but what about uh, the logistics people who were supposed to practice uh, ship to shore logistics? What about the engineers who had to build bridges? You know, sending a bridging unit all the way to an exercise just to have them killed may be realistic for the exercise, but those soldiers are gonna be missing out on an opportunity to actually do any training. Instead, they're gonna be sitting back in their, in their barracks or their tents smoking cigarettes, wondering what the hell they're doing there. So sometimes you have to restart the exercise because people need to complete a portion of their exercise because they still need to do their individual and collective training. I was op for in Germany. Uh, the OCs, observer controllers, um, or I think now they call them OTCs, observer trainer coach, um, they would restart exercises all the time because someone didn't get a chance to do their job. And you know, you're fighting against the op for, you need that realism, but if your whole unit gets wiped out, you're not gonna be able to get your collective training in. So um, <clears throat> they changed the rules so that people wouldn't go home and be asked, what'd you do with the exercise? Nothing, smoke cigarettes. So sometimes there, there is a reason why the military does what they do. They got the information they needed and now they needed to, to check the box and get all that other training done for those units that were participating in the exercise. <clears throat> Finally, Jonas asks, couldn't cluster munitions be effective for mine clearing of areas that are heavily mined with anti-tank mines? 
So cluster munitions are uh, essentially bombs or artillery shells that break open and re reveal multiple bomblets, sometimes hundreds of bomblets. And cluster munitions were actually pretty useful back before GPS and inertial guidance had any measure of accuracy. And inertial guidance being like the accelerometer in your phone. So the problem with cluster bombs is that they hit each other in the air. When the, when the, when the shell breaks open, the cluster bombs will, will hit each other and that will cause duds. Uh, I believe for NATO cluster bombs, it's between like two and 4%. Well, that was verbally told to me by an EOD guy. He also said that for Russian cluster munitions, the dud rate was up to 40%. Um, and those duds essentially become mines when they hit the ground. So I don't believe any kind of cluster bombs would work because, because first of all, there, there's really only two ways of breaching a minefield. The first is you, you plow the mines out of the way. The second is you blow them up. And the way to blow them up is essentially with a sympathetic detonation. So a bomblet might not have the strength to cause that sympathetic detonation. It might not land in the pattern that you need to cause that sympathetic detonation. And that's why a Miklik shoots a line across the minefield and just gets everything on, well, uh, I believe eight meters on either side of that high explosive, uh, essentially tube sock. So uh, if you use a cluster bomb, you're not guaranteed to destroy all the mines. Um, it's so it's it, number one, it's just not an efficient use of resources. And number two, you know, you get, then you got to get a plane to go there. And if, if, Ukrainian airspace was unrestricted enough to allow a plane to fly and drop cluster bombs over top of uh, the front lines, then they would have already broken through <laughs> because those planes would have been pounding Russian positions using close air support uh, and, and freeing up those, uh, uh, those um, sappers, the people who actually breached the minefields to do their job you know, expeditiously or um, <clears throat> actually breach that minefield in a way that guarantees people can safely get through. And that's all we have for the week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Oh, hi, America, it's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a high mile shirt because it fires rockets and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha ha, ha ha, you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. And I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm gonna get a US Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shirt. Now I'm gonna get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna get. Oh no, it is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan McBeth does all the work, yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunker Branding to fund Ryan McBeth to increase your understanding. Oh yeah!